Thank you for joining us. Good morning. My name is Alyssa Dallas, and I'm the Assistant Director of Academic Outreach and um, Engagement at the Tower Center. We're excited to have you here um, and have our guest speaker for today. Um, so our guest speaker is uh, Carmen Mazera. She's been the Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs since January 2014. Um, previously, she served as the Director of Programs and Operations at, at the Bretton Woods Committee, Executive Director of the Fair Trade Federation, Assistant Director for Education and Outreach at Le the Atlantic Council of the United States, and Director of Alumni Re Relations for the School of International Service at American University. Um, I emailed you all a, a longer bio, so I encourage you to read that as well. Um, but just before we get started, before I turn it over, um, to Ms. Mazera, um, a couple housekeeping, I guess. We're gonna start with a presentation for about 25 minutes, um, and then we're gonna go into Q&A at the end. So hold your questions until then. Uh, for your questions, please use the Q&A function that is on Zoom. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Ms. Mazera. Thank you so much, Elisa, and thanks to all of you for being here early in the morning. Uh, greetings from gloomy, dreary old DC. I am very excited to share with you some best practices in applying to graduate school broadly. But as was said, I work with the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs and Policy. And so I'm also happy to answer any particular questions about that field and those kinds of schools. So to get started, let me share with you some slides that hopefully you all can see. And if not, we'll go from there. So the first question, of course, might be, why is it that you want to go to graduate school? Some of it might come from a desired change in salary. The US Department of Labor estimates about a 30 to $40,000 difference in salary between those with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So there may come a time when you need that graduate degree in order to advance financially. You may want to master a particular subject to really delve deeply into a particular topic and unpack it in a way that's quite different from what happens on the undergraduate level where you may have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it doesn't have to be a topic that has a really narrow and fine point. For example, my master's degree is in international politics, which is obviously a huge field, but it's still with a distinct space that you can wrap your arms around and try to master that particular aspect. You may also find that there comes a point in your professional life, at, could be sooner, could be later, when your capacity to advance, your, the jobs that you wanna compete for all require that graduate degree. And so you would need it in order to move to that next level and, and spring forward into those future positions. And at least for our schools, the PE and APSIA is for professional schools. They're professionally focused. So it really is about building out a toolkit that's going to make you competitive in the professional space going forward. So if you weigh all of these issues and you decide that now is the time where you're thinking about going to graduate school, let's talk through some best practices and actually putting that application together. In a perfect world, and I know that we don't live in a perfect world, but in a perfect world, in about 12 months before you would want to enroll, you would start the discernment process and start to figure out what kinds of programs make the most sense for you. And that's not necessarily what the degree is called. It really is about doing research into the programs. And in a minute, I'll give you some questions you can ask yourself as you try to sort between all of the different options that are available. This far out, we also encourage you to create a spreadsheet or use something on your phone or a piece of paper, a Google Doc, whatever you need to keep track of all of the different moving parts that are gonna come together as part of the application process. You're gonna have a lot of details and a lot of, of moving pieces and moving parts. So it's really important that even at this early date, you start to keep track of what needs to go where. You also need to work on your financial planning at the same time as you work on your application planning. The two have to happen simultaneously. And we'll talk in a little bit about some of the many, many, many different ways to pay for graduate school. But again, they have to both happen at the same time so that you don't get to the point where you turn all of your application materials in, you get into a program and only then do you say, oh wait, how exactly am I gonna pay for this? You really need to do the two of them simultaneously. So as you think about graduate school, any kind of graduate school, there's only five questions we encourage you to ask yourself. The first, of course, is what is it that you will study? And again, that's not necessarily what the degree name is called, because particularly in our space, 
there's a lot of different degree names and they have a lot of different things going on underneath. So look underneath, look at the structure of a program. Is it highly prescriptive? Are they going to tell you exactly what courses you take and exactly what order? And first you do this and then you do that. Is it really flexible? Are they gonna let you marry together lots of different kinds of interests and pull together lots of different things in order to create that master's program? Most schools are somewhere on that spectrum between highly flexible and highly prescriptive. So understand for yourself what it is you're trying to put together in a program and whether that structure makes sense for you. It's also important to look at the core courses that you have to take and the elective courses that you get to take to again, make sure that those couple years of your life are really gonna get you the exposure to the things that you want and the things that you need. The second question is, are you qualified? <clears throat> and I promise there is not one number that's gonna get you into graduate school or keep you out of graduate school, but it is useful and important to understand where you fit relative to that imaginary average candidate that schools are gonna talk about on their websites and in their materials. Understand which ones are a bit of a stretch where you don't necessarily look just like that average imaginary candidate, which ones you look pretty solidly like that average candidate, and which ones you're a little more competitive than that average imaginary candidate. And as you apply to different schools, perhaps making sure you don't just apply to the ones that are a bit of a stretch or just apply to the ones where you're a little more competitive, make sure you sort of try to go for a range of those different options. The one caveat to that would be as you look at the admissions criteria, if they say must have the ability to stand on your head and you don't have that, you either need to get it before you apply or that's not necessarily gonna be a program that's the right fit for you. So understanding the admissions criteria and understanding where you fall vis-a-vis -vis them can be an important, an important point of discernment. Another key piece that a lot of folks miss is do you like, do you want to be where that program is located? In international affairs, we're very lucky in that there's no one set location you have to be in order to get a job or to be successful. I know a lot of times people think, but I have to be in DC or I have to be in Tokyo or London or New York. No, you, you don't. You can be in lots of different places and still have a wonderful, fulfilling career in international affairs with lots of access to opportunities. So if you love Texas and can't possibly imagine leaving, then looking at at our schools or other schools in Texas may make the most sense for you. If you can't wait to get the hell out of Texas, then looking at schools outside that area. If you really wanna be in a big city, looking there. If you hate a big city, avoiding those places. So thinking about the kinds of places you need to be to survive and thrive for at least the two years of that program are gonna also be an important, an important point of discernment. We talked a little bit about your financial situation, but really getting your hands around what is the total cost across both years or all of the program, looking at that summer internship or summer opportunities that you might have access to, looking at not just what tuition is, but what the full cost of living and the full package is gonna be, and understanding your own comfort level with debt or your own access to financial aid is also a really important discernment point. So making sure you ask yourself, can I afford this? What is the full cost? What am I committing myself to? And what kinds of financial aid will I have access to? But I think the most important question is the fifth one on this list. What is the professional fit of that program relative to what it is that you're trying to do and accomplish? And if you're not quite sure about that yet, one good way to get some more information might be to explore online and read different job descriptions, read the bios of people whose jobs just sound really cool and fun, and as you do that, you're gonna to start to see some common threads. If you read 10 job descriptions for which you are totally unqualified right now, but they all ask for similar things, you know that between now and when you wanna compete for that job, you need to build those couple key criteria. And so they become important signposts on the highway as you move forward. And you can hold that list up and say, I really wanna build this and this and this, and this program has that and that, but not that. Oh, and this other one has all three. So it can really give you a good measuring stick to use to hold up to programs and make sure that you are building during those couple years of your grad program, the right skills and tools that are gonna tee you up for success in the future. Some of that might also just be about flexibility of a program because you never know exactly what you might need, but perhaps one program really gives you a lot of capacity 
to, to navigate between sectors and a different program may not. So again, these are important points of discernment that you can look for as you try to figure out what program makes the most sense for you. So after you've cast that broad net and you've done a lot of research, it's important to start to focus in on the schools that really make the most sense for you and the ones that you want to apply to. There's lots of different events and opportunities for you to start to build relationships and get to know admissions counselors. And I'll tell you about some of ours shortly. But a great question to ask is, what are the priorities of the admissions committee? What are you looking for in students? They are unfortunately not going to tell you, oh, you just write this and then you get in. But they will describe the sorts of traits they're looking for. They'll tell you about the process and who's being involved in the decision making. And that will give you some key indicators not only of what you need to draw out in your own application, but also if the kinds of things they describe just sound awful to you, you know that that's not the right fit. So again, this is an important part of the research and the discernment about what programs make the most sense for you to apply to. Once you've finalized that list of programs and you've really zeroed in on your target schools, you need to start to think about how to be as competitive as possible. So if there are weaknesses in your application relative to their criteria, relative to just the general sense of what they're looking for, this point, which is about, again, in a perfect world, six to nine months out, is really your chance to start to work on those things so that when you turn your application in, you know you're as competitive as you can be. You may need to take standardized tests and we can talk about that if you like, but we also encourage you to do that this far out so that if you need to take them again, Again, you have that runway, you're, you're ready to turn in the best scores possible. If you can this far out, we also encourage you to start to gather some of the, the more easily accessible materials of your application so you can knock those pieces out and really be ready to, to do the, the harder work on the more complex things later on closer to the actual application deadline. And then of course you have to keep working on your financial aid planning at the same time as you're working on your application. So on the whole, what kinds of things might schools be asking for? I cannot stress to you enough that every school is going to be different, so please read and follow their directions. But generally speaking, the list that you see is one that schools are commonly looking for. An application form, an application fee, okay? A CV or a resume, they're different things. Make sure you know which one a school is actually asking for. They're probably gonna ask for transcripts from every institution that you have attended. So if you studied abroad and directly enrolled in the University of Madrid, then you need to be ready to reach out to that school and ask for your transcripts. COVID has complicated some of this process because folks aren't in the office very often or it's touch and go. So really being able to, to tackle these things early gives you a long lead time in case there are hiccups in getting those kinds of things and transcripts. So again, this is one of those things that the sooner you can start to work on it, the less stress for you close to the deadline. Again, some schools are gonna ask for GREs or, or GMATs or the LSATs. It's gonna depend on the institution and the kind of program. Most of our schools that still do ask for standardized tests, it is the GRE, but I've had some questions about whether they would take other tests and that's really gonna vary on a school by school basis. You're gonna to need to put together some personal statements and or some topical essays on a question, and we'll talk about those in a minute, you're gonna to need some letters of recommendation. And I just sent Elisa's a piece that I wrote with some tips on getting a quality letter of rec, but I'm happy to answer any of those sorts of questions too in the, in the chat time uh, so that we can talk about what really is gonna make a quality letter of recommendation for you. And then you're gonna need some sort of financial statements, particularly if you're applying to a graduate school outside of your home country, but in any case, to compete for financial aid, you'll typically need some sort of financial documentation to talk about your situation. So thinking about the personal statements, I know this is a common stress point for folks. It certainly was for me. Uh, and I want to encourage you all to think about how you tell a distinct story and one that's really personal just for you. And if you're not sure how to structure that, one simple way might be to think about who were you? What are the work experiences, the life experiences, volunteer, whatever it is that has shaped who you are today, this person applying for graduate school? And why is this person today wanting to go to graduate school at this time? Why not a couple years ago? Why not a couple years from now? What is it about this moment that drives you to make this decision to apply? And then who is it that you want to be? 
how is that program, that particular program, a springboarding to this future version of yourself that's going to draw on who you were, shape who you are, and then help make you who you want to be. So telling that distinct narrative is something that schools are really only going to get from you. And that's important because if they're going to read truly, in some cases, 2,000 applications and your application 1,503, they're going to really want to hear something distinct, something unique, something that only they can get from you. And that's quite different than some of our colleagues who are going to start an essay with the same generic quote about being the change you wish to see in the world or a small group of people are the only committed thing that's ever made any difference, whatever it is. Those essays they're going to have read before, but your story, your essay is something they're only going to hear from you. And it's really going to help you stand out from sometimes those truly other thousands of applications that they're going to read. So building it in that way can, can be a great way to compartmentalize and really draw out some distinct elements that help them see why you should be in their program. So you've cast that wide net and you focus and focus and focus and focus. And then just before the application deadline comes the time to really make sure everything is as sharp and clear as it can be. You got to finish your application. You got to finish your financial aid pieces. You got to check in with your recommenders to make sure they're, they're aware of all the deadlines and turning everything in by the time you need it. You need to keep up with your financial planning. And then comes that wonderful day, oh scary day, wonderful day when you finally submit everything and it goes into the system. And it, it was a, a, quite a, a trepidatious day or a, a day of uh, feelings uh, for me at least, but it's the product of all of this work, all of this research, all of this discernment that you've done. So it's also a really good day too, as you finally turn everything in to the particular school. Because you've worked so hard, it's really important that you avoid making foolish mistakes that are gonna cut your knees out from underneath you even before you have a chance to fully be considered. So the first mistake that a lot of folks make is they simply don't follow directions. If a school asks for three letters of rec, turn in three letters of rec, don't turn in five, don't turn in two, turn in the three that they asked for. This can also be a key place where if you have extra copies of documents or maybe an extra copy of your transcripts and you check and you see and they tell you they don't have that piece, you can quickly plug in that hole and make sure that at a minimum, you have done the things that they ask for. You would be amazed how many of our colleagues cannot handle that. And so just take them out of consideration by not completing the application in full. It's also important that you avoid making foolish mistakes like typos and, and just grammatical errors in the documents you put forward. So asking someone else, a friend, a partner, a roommate to read your application materials First and foremost, yes, for typos and, and grammatical mistakes, but also for the version of yourself that comes out in these essays. If you've talked to the schools and you know that they really value someone with a call to, to service or a lot of quantitative ability or something, some other trait that they're really looking to see, when someone else reads your essays and tells you about you based on that essay, if you don't hear those traits that you really wanted to draw out, you know that you perhaps need to reshape the piece to be sure those elements really come forward. In a lot of cases, this is the primary way they're gonna to get to know you. So be sure the version of yourself that comes forward really is the one that you want. It's also an important thing to, to keep track of all of those different pieces as we talked about, because another foolish mistake that folks make is they simply turn in the wrong documents to the wrong place. So if you're applying to George Washington University, and Georgetown University and Georgia Tech, make sure that the Georgia Tech materials go in the Georgia Tech file. Because my colleagues from George Washington, if they're reading this essay about how badly you want to go to Georgia Tech, they're going to say, oh, well, then they probably should. And out it goes. So just at a very basic minimum, make sure you've checked to make sure the right things go to the right place. Or again, you've taken yourself out of consideration before everything's really even gotten underway. Another critical component to all of this is being sure you've really talked and thought about what it is you want to master and why. What is it about that program? What is it about that subject that really is the thing that makes sense for you? And if there's other aspects that happened in your life, maybe you had a rough transition into college, maybe you had a, a family issue or a health issue, 
that caused a, a bit of a hiccup in your academic career, your professional development in life, talk about it. They're going to see it in your transcripts. They might see it in your resume, hear about it in a letter of rec. Disclose those things, talk about them straightforwardly, and maybe you have this, this great story of resilience where you had a bit of a, a hard time getting into undergrad or getting in sync in undergrad, and then you have this great time now that you're, you're farther along in your academic career, so you can tell me this story of overcoming that particular challenge. If it's an issue where you're not sure where the line is between telling this triumphant story of resilience and really oversharing some personal details, again, having that personal relationship with the school will enable you to say, look, there's this thing that happened. I'm not sure how much to talk about it. You're going to see it in my grade. What should I do? And they'll be able to give you a sense of where the line is between really oversharing some personal aspect of your life and telling that, that great triumphant story. So being, being clear and open about those things, because the schools are going to see them anyway, can give you a sense of, of how to, to tell that story in a way that makes sense and doesn't undercut your, your eligibility. Unfortunately, even after you've done all that amazing work, your work isn't done. First and foremost, you have to confirm that everything you think you turned in, they got. And most schools these days have the ability to do that online. And so you can just check and confirm and make sure that everything is there that you think you sent. You need to thank all of your recommenders and keep them updated on your progress with different schools. This is important because you never know when you're going to need them and their advice again, but also because you don't know who they know at that particular institution to stay in contact with to make sure that they're, they're continuing to be an advocate for you. And you again need to keep up with both your, your school discernment and your financial planning. Those two pieces really aren't done. And my hope, of course, is that all of you get into every graduate program that you apply to. And so at some point you're gonna have to pick. So continuing to learn and continuing to advance is really, really important. One of the most common questions that I get is, what are schools looking for? And I promise you, it really is the holistic approach to these things. As I said, there's no one number that's gonna get you in and there's no one number necessarily that's gonna keep you out. So schools wanna understand your ability and your aptitude for academic success. It's an academic program. They wanna make sure that you are gonna be ready to survive and thrive in their program. Our schools in particular, but all schools I think, are also trying to understand your sense of professional direction. Are you teed up for professional success? And that's again, why they're gonna to wanna to see letters of recommendation, perhaps from professional sources, they're going to want to see your resume, they're going to want to see that in your personal statements. Does this program make sense for your broader professional goals? So academic success, professional success, but they also want to hear what you can contribute into the classroom to elevate everybody else's academic and professional success. So that's again in your personal statements telling about the things that you can distinctly contribute based on your experiences, how you can help elevate everybody else is gonna be an important consideration so that they say, oh yeah, that's really a perspective we'd love to have in the classroom. Let's bring so-and-so in as part of this new incoming class of students. We mentioned that, I've mentioned a couple of times paying for school and I wanted to briefly touch on the many, 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 many different ways there are to pay for graduate school. Some funding is gonna come from the institution itself. It might be merit-based aid, it might be need-based aid. It could be something coupled with work with a faculty member, like a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. All of those opportunities from a school, I really encourage you to read what the terms are, what the conditions are. What of that money is a loan, money you have to pay back? What of that money is a grant, money you don't have to pay back? Are there limits or conditions about the kind of work you can do outside of that position? All of those different factors are really important and that funding comes specifically from the school itself. It's also important to note that even need-based aid is going to be based on the quality of the application that you put forward. Need is always going to be greater than the amount of financial resources, so they are going to pick the kids from among those who need aid who put together the strongest application. So that's again why all those pieces and, and telling a, a good story is really important. Aside from the school-based money, there may be funding on the broader university level. So again, having those relationships with schools can be really useful and important. So you can turn to a school and say, I would love to come to your program. The financial package just isn't quite ready to work for me. Might there be money on the central university level for a student like me? 
And perhaps they'll come back and go, oh yeah, actually there's this university-wide scholarship program for kids with the last name that starts with a Q and here you go, here's another couple extra thousand dollars. It doesn't always happen. It might, it's not always possible, but it only happens when you have that relationship and the school will go and look on the university level outside of their own pots of money for extra funding for you. I paid for graduate school by working at the institution, which is another benefit that some universities offer as, a, as an, in, an in, a different way of paying for graduate school as well. So that's the money that comes on the school level and on the university level, but there's also lots of sources of funding externally long before you go to a bank and borrow funds. So it's thinking about yourself in lots of different ways and then seeing what grad school funding is linked to that can be an important way of making school accessible. So there may be funding for what you want to do after graduate school. Programs like the Pickering, the Wrangle, and the Payne Fellowships couple funding for graduate school with careers at the US State Department and the US Agency for International Development. They're not alone in this. The intelligence community has them. Lots of different sectors have graduate school funding and then opportunities for different careers. We haven't really gotten into a lot about careers in international affairs, which I'm happy, happy to do during the Q&A. And there's a ton of resources on our website too about all of the different paths within the field. There might also be funding for what you do between undergraduate and graduate school. For those who might be thinking about the Peace Corps, that's a way to spend two years overseas doing great projects, getting lots of language and intercultural experience, program management experience, and then it gets coupled with graduate school funding. So what you do between those two years can also be an important way of figuring out how to pay for school. There may be also elements just inherent to who you are. Mem citizens of members of the Organization of American States, like US citizens, can compete for graduate school funding just simply based on their citizenship. It can be based on your gender identity, your faith community, the geography from the part of the world or the part of the country that you're from, your, your race, your ethnicity, all of those different pieces. And then something as simple as a Google search that puts that trait, graduate school funding and hit return can turn up lots of possibilities that you may not have known about, but it really comes down to the thinking about all the different layers of who you are and what you're interested in. There are also things that you can do while still an undergrad. For those of you who are juniors or not yet juniors, the Public Policy and International Affairs Program is a wonderful seven week baptism in a lot of the traits of policy and international affairs like quantitative analysis, policy memo writing, uh, economics, all of those different pieces, and it comes with graduate school funding. So what you do while you're still an undergrad, I have friends who paid for graduate school because of scholarships they got from being part of the debate team, Model UN, all of these different pieces can be linked to graduate school funding. So there's lots and lots of ways to pay for school before you have to go to a bank and borrow a lot of money. I wanna share with you as I wrap up some of the many links and, and resources that we have here at APSIA. As I said, we have a ton of events and I'll tell you about one in particular in a minute. We have a filterable directory of fellowships and scholarships, pay for graduate school, work experience, research, language training, lots of different things. And you can search based on some traits of, of students like you or look at the whole list. We have profiles on all of the, the schools that are part of the APSIA family. So if you're not even sure who teaches these issues, that can be a great place to start and you can read about them and see links to employment outcomes, sometimes take a virtual tour of campus, lots of different tools and resources. And then I briefly mentioned the many careers within international affairs. And we have a whole guide to those different careers on our website. Read a little bit about a field, get some tips for getting in and then some suggested employers as well. We're as active as we can be on social media. So I encourage you to follow us across different channels for internships, jobs, fellowships, student stories, random things that make that amuse me on a Friday, whatever it is, we, we post as much as we can there. So it's a really good way to stay engaged and find opportunities that you might not otherwise be, be aware of. Last but not least, I want to invite you to join us. We're having a series of small group conversations around different topics. So if you think you're interested in cybersecurity or public diplomacy or um, program, studying graduate school in Europe, any of those different topics, we're convening these small group conversations. So again, you can really start to build those relationships and get some face time with schools in a way that you may not otherwise be able to do. So they're, they're running all through the end of October and into November. 
And I encourage you to check it out and come visit us and get to meet our schools. And so with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and come on back. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, our first question is about, I guess, kind of taking a, a gap here. So how do schools view the time between undergraduate and graduate school? So whether it is um, taking time off, is that helpful to take time off? Is there a penalty for taking time off or going straight through? Um, if you can speak to that a little bit. Sure. I don't think there's a penalty necessarily, but I would encourage you if you can to take a couple years in between. I didn't and I really wish that I had. And there's really two reasons for that. One is for your own benefit. I think it's really helpful for your own discernment to figure out what it is you want to master. What questions get you excited? What do you wanna spend two years of your life doing that, that deeper exploration of? So it's, it's just a good process to go through by being exposed to things that you may not have been exposed to as an undergrad. I also think it's helpful for the schools because your essays and your, your arguments about why you wanna to go to that program are stronger because you've done those couple years of, of extra discernment. There are some schools that have a baseline admissions criterion that says must have at least two years of work experience. So that might be the only place where if you don't have it, there are gonna be schools that are, are not going to be possible because you won't meet their base admissions criteria. But it's not um, impossible to get in to most institutions, but I just think it's really helpful to spend those couple years. And how you spend those couple years can really take on a, a wide range of forms depending on what your interests are. And I'm happy to talk more about that if, if folks have questions. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another question in. So what are some ideas on how to build relationships with schools that you might not, not, might not already have a relationship with? Well, I'm really biased, but obviously I think our events are a great way to do that. Uh, and it may be schools that you would not have thought of or been exposed to. So we do these open houses where we have a couple schools and it's, it's just a very informal chance for you to ask questions. A lot of schools have, especially now, webinars, uh, virtual open houses. You can also just email them and say, I saw your school. It sounds kind of cool. Can we set up a time to talk? This is, this is part of what they do on a regular basis. So going to our events, going to their events, and just straight asking to talk to them can be really basic ways. There's a million, especially now, online graduate school fairs and this event and that event. So you, you have a, a, an embarrassment of riches in terms of chances to, to get to know them. But if there's a particular school that you had not heard of or aren't gonna have a chance to go fly over and visit, it, it's perfectly reasonable to just bring them up and say, can I come talk to you? Can we schedule a chance to, to Zoom? Thank you. Um, I want to go back a little bit, I guess. So um, as an undergraduate, are there things that students can do to kind of make them a better candidate for graduate school? So getting involved, for example, in undergraduate research or the things like that, are there things that schools look for? Sure. I think there's several traits. Um, one is definitely internships. And especially now, there's a lot of online opportunities to get experience. And again, some of that is, is just about having the experience, but some of it is also about being exposed to things and saying, oh, I like that, or dear God, please never make me do that again, both of which are equally beneficial. So the UN Volunteer Corps has a whole online component, and you can do everything from project evaluations to language translations to, there's such a broad range. The federal government has the Virtual Student Federal Service, and the application process for that is closed, but again, it's a chance for you to virtually intern with different federal agencies, get to know them, get exposed to them. So any of that, and there's a ton of stuff probably going on in your local communities that we can also talk about that has an international component to it. So any of that kind of, of practical experience is gonna be really beneficial. Research, for sure, writing, can you take all of the stuff that you know in your head and convey it in a short, clear, concise way? So not necessarily that 60 or 70 page paper your faculty members are gonna ask you to do, but can you take that 60 page paper and convey all the same stuff in two pages? Because that's the professional trait that a lot of folks are gonna need. So clear writing, the ability to be comfortable in front of lots of different groups of people. If you hate public speaking, now is a great safe time to volunteer, to be the one who gives the class presentation. All of that is gonna be really useful. The ability to take an idea that you have in your head and turn it into a reality. 
So it could be in your faith community, it could be with a school club, it could be with a class project. Any chance to say, I thought of this thing and then I did something about that thing that I thought of can be a really useful story to tell. And then language skills would be the other critical thing, particularly in our space. If you have the ability to gain them or if you already have them, don't lose them, keep practicing. Again, one of the weird benefits of COVID is that there's such global access to stuff. So make a new friend in the country of the language that you speak or make sure that you continue to meet with different groups. A lot of the embassies that are based in Washington but probably have consulates all over Texas are doing programming now, they're showing movies, they're having meetups to talk about and, and use those languages, celebrating those cultures. So tap into all of those kinds of things. Um, and I guess I know I said that was the last one. The other, other last one that I would mention would be um, using this weird time as a chance to build out your network and deepen your understanding of an issue that you're interested in. Events and, and organizations that typically would have had in-person stuff going on in DC or New York or LA or Tokyo, whatever, all of that is online now. So you can go, you can ask questions during those sessions. You can deepen your knowledge, learn to speak the acronyms and speak the language of that particular space. And then you can also follow up with the speakers afterwards and say, I saw you at that event that Brookings did on submarine warfare. And I really liked your point about that. Could could I talk to you about what careers in counterterrorism and submarine warfare really looks like? And a lot of people are going to be open to that now. So you capitalize on those events, get on those mailing lists, go to those activities and broaden your knowledge of who's out there, what they're talking about and just how that space sounds because then all of that can fold back into your grad school application materials. And again, also that discernment about what careers make the most sense for you. Thank you. Um, kind of staying on that topic of experience. So for a resume or a CV, are there things that, or just how far back should a student go in terms of what they put on their resume or their CV? Um, yeah, we'll start with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I am adamant, and there's lots of different opinions on this, but I have my life, my mic is live, so you get mine, that particularly as an undergrad, if your resume is more than one page, what the hell are you doing? Just no. If you won the science fair in the fourth grade, that is lovely. I don't care unless I am the Association of Fourth Grade Science Fair winners, right? Too far. High school, if you are more than a freshman in college, it's too, don't care. Unless it's directly relevant, again, to the opportunity or to the position that you're applying to. If you were an Eagle Scout in high school and you're trying to tell a graduate school or an employer about your deep call to service, then yes, okay, your Boy Scoutness in high school is relevant, but otherwise it's not. So I would say a one page resume that goes back to maybe the beginning of university is probably the right guidepost, unless there's something really deliberate and specifically relevant from before that, that makes sense to the position you're applying to. Because I just, you if you were 15 and doing stuff and now you're 22, too far, too far, in my, in my very cranky old opinion. Thank you. Uh, talking about um, graduate school and trying to find an advisor. So are there tips that you have for trying to find a good advisor? You know, oftentimes on paper, they may look awesome, but then when you get to meet them, maybe not so much. So do you have tips on how to go, go about navigating that process? So this, our space is going to be a little different than say the hard sciences, where the hard sciences are going to have, even on the graduate school level, sort of match you with a faculty member and then um, really have much more of a mentorship relationship where the quality of that mentor is really going to shape the quality of your experience. Our folks, when it happens, it's going to be more on the departmental wide level. So you may be within a department that's looking at questions of international development or national security or peace and conflict resolution, whatever it is. And so some ways to just get a general feel of how that department is and how supportive they are one is you can ask to talk to current students in that particular space and say, I see all these famous people listed on the website. Do you ever actually see them? And they'll go, oh yeah, no, they don't, they never come to campus. They don't have office hours. They don't teach. They're just on the letterhead. Or yeah, I see, and I'm making this up, like Madeline Albright on campus all the time. Yeah, she would just hang out. You know, she bought me beer, whatever. Um, and she would not do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> but you'll, you'll, again, you'll get a general flavor from the students themselves. You can ask to talk to alumni. 
you can often ask to talk to the faculty directly too. And that will give you, again, a general sense, depending on the kind of answer you get back, how that culture fits with what you're looking for. But unless you're going for a PhD, it's less likely that you know, in the, the fields of international affairs and, and probably social sciences more broadly, you're gonna have that direct one-to-one -one mentor relationship. One of the other follow-up questions to that that I often get is how, how critical is it in your application materials that you specifically mention faculty you wanna work with or specifically mention courses you wanna take? And my answer is it's, in, it's, it's important and useful to demonstrate knowledge of the school and a deliberate reason why you're applying to their program and to use those kinds of things as attributes that showcase why their program makes sense for you. But if it's so constricting, I'm only coming to your school because I wanna take this one class with this one professor, it, it can also hurt you because you don't, that professor may leave to go have a baby and isn't gonna be there or is going on sabbatical for two years and will not be anywhere near you during that time. And so if you painted yourself into this really narrow box, it can, it can undercut your competitiveness because they think, well, they're only coming to study with that one person and that one person isn't gonna be here, so they're not really gonna be happy. So finding that balance between demonstrating knowledge and the reason why you like their program and totally locking yourself into this really narrow thing is, is gonna also be an important trait in your application. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, we have two more questions. So the first one is, um, so a student who's a Navy veteran and wants to include their military experience on the application. So how, what do graduate schools look for um, in terms of military experience or how do you package that experience? I, I can think of it in several ways. Some of it is going to be your, your call to service and to, to being part of something bigger than yourself. Some of it might be if you were deployed overseas and that was what's driving you to have an interest in these larger questions. Some of it might be the, the on the ground experience in, in matters of security or supply chains and logistics, or interacting with people and cultures different from yourself. So there's lots of things depending on what you did in the Navy. Maybe it's your, your interest in clean oceans and clean water, I don't know. Um, so whatever it is about your service that has called you into that particular field. Um, and I think military experience is a great way, again, to show a call to service something broader than yourself, an interest in, in how the US lives in the world, all of those different issues that are directly relevant to our state. Schools love having veterans in class because it's one of those kinds of experiences that again can elevate everybody else's academic and professional thinking. Some of the best classes I had, I had somebody who'd been um, an NGO worker on the ground in Iraq and a guy who'd been an army officer in Iraq. And the two of them really saw questions about what was going on in terms of development and peace building really differently, but they helped all the rest of us who hadn't been there see things in a, in a more complex way. And so there's a lot about your experience you might draw out to, to talk about how that's a really good perspective you can bring in that others couldn't. Thank you. Um, the other question we have is about resumes. So students who, who is considering applying for both an MBA and a master's in public policy and has been working for two years. And so he's asking what, whether it would be appropriate to include undergraduate organizations that he led um, at, at SMU and then also listing research grants that he was accepted for. I think all of that would be relevant, particularly if they're organizations or research grants in the space that you're applying for. So if you did a lot of great research on education policy and you're applying for a master's in education policy, yeah, that's absolutely relevant and connected. Um, if you led the undergraduate student group on basket weaving, maybe that's one that you leave off in the interest of space. And you can just say, there's many other things that I did that I would love to talk to you about, but this is all I have room for. So um, again, if it's relevant and connected and helps advance the narrative that you're trying to put forward, it makes sense to include it for sure. Um, and in terms of resumes overall, I think there's, there's so many different ways to do it, but no matter how you do it, it needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, and it needs to be connected to the thing that you're applying for. So in some cases, how your resume looks when you submit to that MBA program might shift a little bit compared to the kinds of keywords and things you draw out when you're applying to that MPP or a Master's of International Affairs or whatever. It's obviously still the same experience that you had, but maybe you rephrase it or you reshape it and you draw out some different things to make it really obvious to whatever school is reading it. Oh, this is what I'm looking for and this is what you have as a, as a candidate. 
perfect, thank you. Um, another question, I guess, is about um, the interview process. So I guess most schools, if not all schools, will probably have an interview process for our students. So are there ways to prep for that, um, things to prepare in that way? At least for our school, it's actually the opposite. Not very many have interviews. Um, and that's why the initial application that you put forward is so critically important because that's the primary tool that they have to get to know you. For those schools that do have it, I think it's the same thing as preparing for a job interview. You're never gonna know exactly what they're gonna ask you, but you can guess what some of the common things are gonna be and just prepare and rehearse your advance answers in advance. So there's a pretty good chance they're gonna ask you why you applied to that school. You should have a clear, easy answer that comes forward without you going, oh, I don't really know why I applied to that school. You know, So being ready for those kinds of common things, being ready to say, oh, I see you've applied for the master's in national security program. What sorts of questions do you wanna unpack? What, what is it about that program compared to our program in trade and finance or our program in international law? That, why did you pick that one? So again, talking about what you've done, who you are, and what you want to be as why you pick X instead of Y, all of that's going to be really important. Um, they, may, they may say, is there a particular faculty member or something? So again, knowing about the school and being able to connect you, you and your experiences to them. So there's things you can anticipate that they're going to ask. They may ask you, you know, what's your favorite kind of taco? And you should have you know be ready for those kinds of things but hopefully that stuff flows a little bit more naturally than you know what do you want to be when you grow up and what are you going to do five minutes after you graduate those are things you can you can rehearse ahead of time and I'm sure there's staff at SMU both for students and for alum who are, are willing and open to, to rehearsing that and, and using their experience to ask you things that you may not have thought of thank you um, I'm sure I you all have very strict feelings about tacos everybody I know from Texas has <laughs> very feelings about tacos. Yes, there's lots of great taco places down here in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have Taco Tuesday. There's places everywhere. Um, <laughs> <I'm jealous. laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I guess another question for a student who's maybe in graduate school or preparing to go to graduate school. Are, are there professional organizations that they should get involved in either before or while in graduate school that will help them get to that next step in their career? Sure. I know our space the best. I don't know about others, but for us, there's a number of groups that are across lots of different sectors within international affairs. So young professionals in foreign policy, young professionals in international affairs. There are some that are more specialized, women in international security, women in international trade, women in cyber and defense. Um, and then there's broader you know, young professionals in cyber, you know, those sorts of, of niche or, or targeted um, constituencies. There are some based on different demographic groups. Women of color advancing peace and security covers all of the spaces of security and peace and development and chemical biological weapon, I mean, all of that, but particularly focused on supporting women of color. Um, you know, black professionals in international affairs. So there's a number of Latino groups. So um, thinking about yourself again with all of those different layers of identity, thinking about your different interests, if you're looking at questions of security, that is a huge thing to unpack. So there's human security, hard security, chemical biological weapons, peace and development, justice. I mean, all of that can fall under the security umbrella and there's constituent groups for all of those different things. Now, a, a simple thing might be even to, to look through LinkedIn and see what groups you can either join or follow. And those are two important distinctions you may not yet qualify to be a young professional in counterterrorism, but you can follow that group and just see the kinds of things they post, see if they have events that are open to the public. Um, there, again, there's broad groups like Women in Foreign Policy that are gonna do lots of events about mentoring, that maybe there's some things they have internal to members, but some things that are open to anybody that you can attend in your jammies from your dorm room in Texas, whatever. So. Again, searching through LinkedIn, even searching through Google can be a key way to, to make those things happen. And if there isn't something on your campus, uh, let's say you're interested in, in questions of poverty, the One Campus campaign is always looking for volunteers to start chapters on their campus or the UN Association for those who are really interested in multilateral organizations. 
um, Oxfam's change makers who want to use policy tools to combat poverty in the US and abroad. So there's lots of opportunities for you to also show leadership and initiative. If there isn't something, you can build it. And, and I talked a little bit about some local work that can be done. Um, some other great groups might be working on questions locally and looking for leaders on immigration, refugees, um, counter human trafficking. All of this is happening really on the hyper local level. And it could be through your sheriff's department, it could be through your mayor's office, the county. Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on about uh, economics and trade, how you get small businesses locally ready to export internationally. So there's a ton of stuff going on that you can get involved in groups and societies within your, wherever you are that, that will let you do that without leaving home or without really leaving your community, especially now when it's so hard to do that. Thank you. Um, and we are actually almost out of time. So I want to say thank you to our speaker, uh, Ms. Nazara, for taking your time and um, sharing information with us about applying to graduate school. And I will also add in that this is our last event for the semester, but we will have more events coming up next semester. So I invite you to check us out on uh, connect.snu to see what other events we have coming up next semester. We're going to definitely have another Coffee with a Leader, virtual Coffee with a Leader. We're also going to have a career panel uh, focused on careers in public policy and international affairs. So definitely check us out. And we hope to see you at a future event. And I put my email in the chat if anyone wants to follow up. I'm absolutely open to that. Just please, in the subject line, tell me who you are. Uh, I get a lot of emails just that say, hello, and that's unhelpful. So uh, happy to talk, but <laughs> give me a little more than that, please.